Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. And welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton as we continue studying about how do we really discover how to revitalize a church, how to replant a church, what are some of the little things that you have to know about, and then the conflicts that you're going to face. How do you deal with those things? Well, today we begin a series that I think is going to be a a real inspiration and blessing for you, and we'll answer a lot of questions as we look at discovering Christ's purpose for his church, because once you have that foundation, then a lot of those other things will begin to fall into place. Uh, my name is Dan Hurst, and here's Mark Clifton. Hey, Dan. How are you, buddy? I'm. Are you doing well? Do I look pretty? You look, you look pretty good. I'm looking pretty. You know, Dan is here with me, as well as Mark Halleck. Hey, guys. Mark has been our regular guest now uh, since way back in the early 1960s, I think, something like that. <laughs> it's been a anyway, while. It's been a while. But Mark is the uh, <laughs> pastor of the Calvary Church in Inglewood, Colorado, a replanted church that has replanted dozens of churches, and so... We're glad to have Mark as our special guest. And just so you can kind of get a picture of where we are, we're around this amazing table in the Spurgeon Library at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City today. This podcast moves around, but that's where we are today. And as a disclaimer, we just came back from a huge Italian lunch. Huge. Right? <laughs> huge. Huge. Ridiculously I just wanted, huge. The win will be if we stay awake. <laughs> I like the fact that when we went to order the food, it was like, Mark, we, we got we got we got Italian nachos as an appetizer. As right? an appetizer. Who, who and, gets and then, Italian and then, nachos? And then we got a big thing of bread, right, with all kinds of oils. Okay? Oh man! And then she comes to take the order, and and Hallett gets a large size of uh, lasagna. And she says, do you want a salad with that? He says, no. And I said, well, you got to cut back <laughs> somewhere, buddy. Can't have it all. Yeah, thanks for that encouragement. Watch so, that boyish figure. <laughs> so we, we've been eating. We're probably going to nod off to sleep while we do this podcast. No, not really. What we're talking about is, is the book Flickering Lamps by uh, Richard and Henry Blackaby. And let me, let me give you a little bit of background real quick. I first was asked to take over uh, or create, really, uh, the replant team at the North American Mission Board uh, a number of years ago, uh, they just realized that we were closing eight to 900 churches a year, and nobody was really addressing that. And so they, they reached out and asked me to, to, to address it and to help create some kind of a strategy moving forward. And and so uh, the first thing I did was call Henry Blackaby. I mean, I, it was a long story. His relationship and me go, go, go way back, and I, I value him a great deal. And I said, Henry, you used to have a book, a little pink book called What the Spirit is Saying to the Churches. It came out before Experience of God. I said, that is what we need because they have to hear Christ speak to them. Well, that book has been out of publication for a long time, and they couldn't publish it again. But his son Richard called me and said, you know, I'm going through some of my dad's stuff in the basement, and and he's got some notes here on something that, that we've been working on, and he and I began to talk, and this would have been in March. I said, man, we got the Southern Baptist Convention coming in June. Could we put a book together between March and June? And he said, normally no. But I think we can. And so he and his dad and, 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 and worked together, and they put together, at, at our request, Flickering Lamps, Christ and His Church. And so if your church is struggling and don't know where to begin, you know, man, how do I get started in revitalization? How do I get back? This is a starting place because the purpose of this book is to help your people realize this church belongs to Jesus, not to them. And it's divided up into several chapters. We'll look at three or four in this episode and the rest of them in the second episode that follows up. But the first chapter is Christ's purpose for his church. And some of the questions that come up in that are, what did the founders intend when they started your church? And what was the unique focus that that church had? That's how you often begin a revitalization. So talk a little bit about when you went to uh, Inglewood, you went to Calvary. Talk about how that fit in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, part of this was in Denver, in the context I'm at, you know, back in, in 1952, when our church was, was founded, you know, it was in Inglewood was the suburbs of Denver. 
Okay, and so I think there was this vision. Denver was a growing city, and and uh, the Southern Baptists were like, "Man, we need a, we need a strong Southern Baptist church out in the suburbs and the southern southern suburbs." And that's where this church uh, started. But from the beginning, one of the uniquenesses about our church is the people who planted our church had a vision for church planting. Did they really? So within, that was kind of unusual in 1952. That was unusual. Yeah. Within the first 10 years, they pl- planted three churches. Really? Yeah, in Denver. So part of that is the DNA of the church. So now what's been really cool is after, you know, an initial surge of church planting, there were decades where the church, our church began to decline. By God's grace, now we're, we're able to recapture this vision that God put on the hearts of the original members of our church to plant new congregations and help replant dying congregations. And so in some ways, that, that vision for our congregation has remained the same, and it fuels really our mission and what we're doing today. Well, I think it's a really important question to ask. What did the founders have in mind when God led them to plant this church? Now, some of you guys who are listening to me in the Southeast uh, the founders were around during the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Seriously, I, I get that. There, we've got some churches that are two hundred years old, and and that kind of thing. But for a lot of you, it, it's it's a hundred years or less. And and you know, really, when Jesus speaks to John in the Book of Revelation, and he's speaking about the church at Ephesus, and he gives them a message. This is what he tells the church at Ephesus: Remember from where you've yeah, fallen. Amen. And so I think one of the first things you have to do in revitalization is remember what we used to be. Remember why we were here. What was the purpose that Christ had for us in this place when we began? What was And what was our unique focus? Yeah, Most churches yeah. had some kind of, like you said, it was a yeah. suburb, yep. and they wanted to reach people. Yep. What was the unique focus, and, and why did yep. those initial people plant that church? That's a really good question. And if they don't know the answer, have them start digging around, yeah, looking at the church yeah. history, finding some old pictures. You see some old pictures of, 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 of vacation Bible school or, or revivals or, or something that was, I know when I went to Warner, we found some old pictures of all kinds of things like that. And no one was alive then that were the, what was there mm-hmm. there at that time. It was been so long ago, but it's like, wow, that's our church. Yeah. It, 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 we had, we had that many teenagers. Yeah. We, had, we had hundreds of children here that those people must have had a real yeah. vision in order to, to reach people like that. And uh, so then you ask the question this, how is it different today than mm, it was yeah. then? Yeah. You know, what are the differences yep. between now yep. and then? And oftentimes in declining churches, and this was the true, true in our case, true with Warnell, is a lot of that, that vision had been kind of lost or distorted, at least on some level. And you move from a, a vi- the vision God had given you at the beginning to more of a maintenance kind of mentality just to keep the doors open. And so... Um, you know, for us, it was really a, it was a pretty clear difference, you know, from a church that had a, a strong vision of an outward focus, multiplying churches, reaching the loss of the gospel to a group of 20 to 30 just trying to pull off a Sunday morning service. And so part of what we had to do is help recast vision and say, listen, we are part of a story. And every church, listen, in the sovereignty of God, he has a story for every church. That's right. And so we're not coming in starting a new story. We need to humble ourselves and recognize God's been writing a story. Right. And now we're coming into at this point in time of this story. And man, I think the best revitalizers I know celebrate the story, what's come before them, and begin to you know dream about what is coming ahead of them. Right. And we so, always say one of the qualities of a revitalizing pastor is you value the church's legacy. Mm. However, here's the deal. Christ's ultimate purpose for his church is to glorify God. Yes. That's why it exists. In fact, we, we talk all the time, and, and Piper brings it out in his little little book, Let the, Mesh, Let the Nations Be Glad. Missions and evangelism is an ultimate. Worship is ultimate. Right. Because missions and evangelism will one time cease. Worship never ceases. And we do missions and evangelism because worship doesn't, doesn't exist, that's right. right? We do that in order to bring people into the, as, as Piper says, the white hot worship of God, yeah. which can only be done through conversion. And so if, if the ultimate goal and purpose, rather, if Christ's ultimate purpose in his church is to glorify God, yeah. well, we've just looked at how that happened in the past. Right. Now the question is, mm. how is your church glorifying God today? In what ways today are you glorifying God? And that's a really heavy question yeah. that churches need to marinate on. What are the visible ways that yeah. the community looks at your church and God gets glory out of that? God's name is made great because of what's going on at your church. Well, and is, is it even part of the language of the church? Probably not. I mean, oh, a good yeah. question for a church to be asking all the time is, 
how are we glorifying the Lord? Right. How is this new program glorifying to God? How is the preaching glorifying? You know, what are we— And glorifying, mean, you know, how, it means a lot of things, but among other things, it means how does this reflect positively yes. on God and who he yes. is? How does it make people think greatly of our God? Spread his fame. Spread his fame, absolutely. So that as you go through this book, there's some great diagnostic questions for your church, and we've just gone through some of them on Jesus' purpose for his church. But the final question that would be asked of your congregation is, all right, this was his purpose. This is how, we, how it happened years ago. This is what's happening now. We're not really glorifying God the way we should, or we wouldn't be in decline. So then the ultimate question is, what are some of the sins for which your church needs mm. to repent? And then I love this. This is so Henry Blackaby on his questions. He would never let you off the hook. What are some of the sins from which your church needs to repent? Then his second question in this book is, when do you intend to do so? I love that. <laughs> I just love that. It's one thing to say yeah, we need that's to. Right. But he's like, put it on the calendar, man. <laughs> intend you to do, do so. Because really, yeah. in, in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, remember how far you've fallen. And the second yeah. thing he says is yeah. what? Repent. Repent. Repent right. and then return. That's what that's what we're talking about here. That is a method. That is the strategy for revitalization. Why is repentance? I mean, this is true of the Christian life, but and if if Blackaby were here, I'd love to hear his response. But why is repentance so critical as a congregation? Right. To move forward in in, in health. I will, I will tell you that from my experience as a as a revitalizing coach, I've really encountered almost no one that I can think of who would look me in the eye and say, I don't, I don't. I don't really want to repent. You know, I don't think we're, I don't think I'm that bad. I've looked at other people. I mean, I'm talking about regular going church yeah, right, members, right? right? Yeah, I'm yeah. talking sure people in the culture might. I'm talking about people who come Sunday night, Wednesday night. Yeah. You know, those yeah. kind of folks. If I had a conversation with them, most of them would not say, I, "I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not as bad as most people, and I, I don't really think I need to repent." But there have been many times corporately that I've dealt with churches that are in deep decline, mm. and you talk about you need to re- your church needs to repent of something, and you can just see the body language. Like, yeah. What are you accusing us of? Right. We're not that bad. We come on Sunday morning. We come on Sunday night. This really isn't our problem. You know, there are churches. There's this resistance to corporately mm. repent. Wow. And I, I, in fact, I went all the way through a revitalization with one church. We had a, a, a church plant that was ready to adopt them. They had voted yes. But one of the things the church needed to do was repent of those decisions they made in the past that had brought the church to the point of closure. And they, they called me one Saturday night and said, we've really talked about that, and we're not comfortable doing that hmm. because that makes it look like it's all our fault. I think, well, <laughs> is it Jesus' fault? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, Henry Blackaby says, if your church dies, yeah. did you follow Jesus into the grave? Hmm. Or did he make a mistake? Did hmm. he make a wrong turn? So... There has to come a repentance. Yeah. And let, go ahead. Let Dan. me ask you a question about that. And, and, and just, uh, I'm curious how you guys are going to respond to this. The repentance process itself <clears throat> is a process, no question about that. But it's not sudden. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of times, and particularly in a corporate setting, let's say you've got a congregation of 24 people. And let's say eight of them repent. Yeah. That sometimes. I'm not saying all the time, but occasionally that creates a division oh, yeah. within the body. Yep. Because now you've got this process that is, in essence, some people say, well, that's judgmental. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. And, and it is judgmental, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you want to get down to it. How do you deal with that? Hmm. That's a really good question. That's a real pastoral care kind of question where you'd have to navigate. And so mm-hmm. much of what you do in a, in a declining church is navigating through, strat- through difficulties, through, through personalities, through conflicts. And I think it's just a lot of pastoral care to deal with those who are not wanting to repent and spend individual time with them and, and talk with them and pray with them and try to encourage them to see what we're talking about. But ultimately, you got to run with the ones who are wanting to repent. Yeah. And if it ultimately means some of them are going to leave, the unrepentant <laughs> ones, then you have to let that happen. As we said in the previous podcast, sometimes in revitalization, you've got to be willing to let people leave if they want to leave. Uh-huh. And I think I think that would be the case. Yeah. So Christ planned for his church to glorify God. Amen. Yeah. And we have to, in order to do that, we most like, well, we are going to have to repent some of the bad decisions we've made and then seek to use our church to glorify him again. Second thing, Christ, that's his, that's his, I'm sorry, excuse me, that was Christ's purpose in his church was to glorify God. Second thing, I'm, this, I'm relatively new at this podcast thing, so I'm making fun. <laughs> You're can doing tell. great. You're doing I, I, I can <laughs> yeah. tell. No, we can tell. I hope it works out. My wife hopes it works out. She hopes I finally get a job I can keep. That's right. Um, 
Yeah, the first thing is Christ's purpose in his church. The second thing is Christ's plan for his church. Well, what well, is well, Christ's well, plan? Well, before we get that, because yeah, yeah, you got yeah. ahead of me on this. I it, did. It was something I want to come back to. All right, go ahead. Do you, is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Because I haven't been doing this podcast that much. <laughs> no, <yet>. either one. <clears throat> one of the points that you made was, how does the church glorify God? Yep. The thing that has just ripped my heart out recently, over the past few months, actually, is that we have... We have discovered, I've seen this happen not just in, in my church, but in, in lots of churches. Our concept of glorifying God is different from God's concept. Mm. And so, you know, our concept of glorifying God is it makes me feel good. Mm, yeah. And, okay. and so I, I remember, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago, I said to them, look, if there's anything about worship that makes you feel good, it's wrong. Mm. If there's anything about worship that, that, that is about what you want, it's not worship. You know, worship is always about God. <clears throat> and I made this statement, and I stand by it. In most churches, in a one-hour, what they call a worship service, it's only about 10 minutes of worship. Mm-hmm. Now, you think about that. Yeah. If in your church you're only doing about 10 minutes of real genuine worship, and it's bookend by the other accoutrements that we kick in to everything from, well, we've got to collect an offering, and we've got to make announcements about the hot dog supper, right, right. You know, and uh, we've got to tell people about the women's meeting, yeah, and yeah. so forth and so on. And then we have a sermon. Yeah. Now, you guys are going to, I know, I'm, I'm, I can, I'm here at the podcast room <laughs> in Spurgeon's library. <laughs> Who even knew he did podcasting? Yeah, but, really. And I'm about to make this statement, and I'd love to, I, I'm going to just watch your, your body language. <laughs> <laughs> the worship is always everything one would you not agree everything 100% about what what God wants mm-hmm. what God likes right. how it makes God feel preaching is about what we need not about what God needs and now it may be what we need and we certainly do need it but in the purest sense of the word is it really worship no, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, because we should. We have to. We need to. I mean, that was the whole principle of why we're called a pastor teach. Yeah. But when we, when we do away with some of the elements of real worship, doesn't it, de- doesn't it detract from everything else that we do in worship? And so how are we glorifying God? If only for a few minutes uh, we say, okay, God, we love you. You're great. We're awesome. Let's have a hot dog supper. Okay, now Piper would disagree with you. And I think I'm with Piper on this one, but I love you a lot. That's a, it's, you know, he, I, I expected he, this. He calls preaching, and I think he's just right because I, I, it's a great question. First of all, I thought a lot about this. He he calls he he refers to preaching as expository exaltation. So in preaching, preaching is worship. In the and I say this as a preacher, I understand this as a preacher. When I go to preach, yes, I want to exhort the people. I want to teach the people. But I want to magnify God Mm -hmm. in my preaching, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't just want to do that myself. I want people to leave amazed at God, worshiping God, blown away by the goodness of God. And so I think, in a sense, if your preaching isn't worship, both from yourself, and if you're not leading your people ultimately to worship, you may be giving a lecture, you may be teaching some kind, you know, a class that's interesting, I don't know if it's actually biblical preaching, though. Yeah, good to see. That's my point. You know know what I mean? So anyway, I mean, that's just an initial thought. Well, I I agree with Mark totally, and um, I think you're totally reprobate, Dan, but nonetheless... (laughs) It's a great question, no, honestly. We love it's you. like we it's a great do. Listen, I grew up with this. His father, my father, <laughs> yeah, right. and, and and Mark himself. Yeah. Just, oh, I never did like you. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I absolutely yeah, do. Totally. If worship is about what we like and what we want and yes. our needs, we're not worshiping. That's right. right. It Period. is not. Period. Yeah. Yep. So absolutely. And I, I think many times preaching doesn't exalt Christ. It doesn't mm-hmm. exalt God. Mm-hmm. It, it can be just almost a, a, a dictating how people should yeah. live and things like that. No, very man-centered, but, but, yeah. But very man-centered. But, and you did say one thing, and I think it's just semantics. I don't think you meant it, but every fiber of my being couldn't let it pass. God doesn't need anything. 
Yeah, that's a good that, point. Okay. He, yeah, he, yeah. he has no need for yeah. our worship. Yeah, you're absolutely None. right. I know you didn't mean it that way. Yeah, it's a semantical thing, it's a semantical and I agree. Thing. But I, it, it's really important for our view of God to realize he does not need us. Right. The fact that we worship him is a gift to us. Right. The most great thing we can do is glorify God. It's the most joyous thing. So he's so mm-hmm. gracious to give us the chance to worship sure. him. And well, he designed us to do that. Exactly. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. so exactly. in that sense of the words, that's what pleases him. Right, right. You know, and so, and, and so that's, yes. that's right. what we need to see happen is Right, that God smiles. The God smiles. And yeah, exactly. And and He smiles because we're enjoying Him. Yeah, He doesn't yeah. need us. That's if right. He never created the earth, if He never created the universe, if He never created anybody, He would still be as completely joyful yeah. and happy right. in Himself as He is. Right. He doesn't need one thing yeah. we can offer Him, yeah. and that's really that's right. important. Yep. So worship is all about how we are given the chance to make much of Him. So thank you, Dan, for getting this completely off track. <laughs> no, because I'm asking hey, about and time is your church glorified. No, no it, God, it is good. You know? And you know what? You know what? We'll just we'll just we'll just do one thing today. We'll just do Christ plan for his church next week. We'll do purpose today. Okay. This was purpose. Christ's right. purpose, which yes. is yeah. to glorify God, yep. make much of him. And your church probably did that at some point in the past. Yeah. But if it's declining, it's probably doing less of it now than ever. Yeah. And one of the first things you need to do is look at worship, corporate worship. We got a whole podcast coming up on corporate worship and yeah. we'll deal with all of that. That's good. But also yeah, again, how how are you not making the right choices and the right decisions to glorify God? How does the community not see God great because of your activity? And at what point are you going to repent of that? And when are you going to repent of it? And if you're not, and I'll, I'll give you one final example. Guys always, churches always come to me and say, hey, we need um, youth, young people. We don't have any young people. And I said, well, how would that work? Well, you could get us a youth minister. The last thing a dying church needs is a youth minister. The first thing a dying church needs to do is be broken and contrite over the lost teenagers in their neighborhood who don't come to church. So until they start spending Wednesday night praying for the lost teenagers that don't come to church, there's no youth program that's going to change anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. All right? Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate being with you. That's about all I can do on an Italian lunch. So you want to take us home? Take us home, Dan. All right. Well, we've been talking about how to discover Christ's purpose for his church from flickering lamps. And so, uh, again, just to kind of recap, how, why was your church founded? How is, how is your church different now than when it was founded? And why, in, in essence? And how does your church glorify God? And then how, and in, in what ways is your church creating that ministry of discipleship? And really, to be honest, how, what are some of the sins for which your church needs to repent? Once you get that foundation, then you can move on to our next podcast. And I hope you'll plan on joining hope us Hope we're then. still here. Oh, the yeah. next podcast is Christ's plan for his church. Okay, so there you go. We so can follow up on that. And please be, uh, be sure to uh, subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to, to know that you're, you're part of our family here and what we're doing. Leave your, your notes and your messages. We, we'd love to hear from you. And once again, thank you to the North American Mission Board for making this possible. And uh, we'll hope to see you at the next podcast. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.